Thank you so much. Well, this is extraordinarily exciting, um, triumphant, um, just a wondrous event this week. This whole week we've had talks, walks, excitement, euphoria. And so I suppose my broadest thanks is to the whole community of San Antonio for taking under your wing the love on behalf of this whole area for Aboriginal art and therefore the whole of the Australian continent because that's what it represents. It's the, the depth, 40,000 years of knowledge about the cosmos and the land and the water and the sea, what's in it, beyond it and above, what's there from birth to life for every human being, not just black, but every colour of the planet. And we can all learn a great deal, as I have my whole life, from listening quietly and sitting under a tree with someone who holds the repository of human knowledge of the earth and human obligations in it and within it uh, for that length of time. My life, as you've just heard, goes back a long way to 1970 in this field. And um, I say field because in one sense it's an academic work, it's anthropological, it's sociological, it's political. But most of all for me, it's been family. From the beginning I was taken in as, as a family member in order to get the information that I needed to promote and develop the work that the Aboriginal elders wanted to do. Firstly, they wanted to be known for what they knew. In the 1970s, Australia was a total outpost in terms of race relations. And I don't need to go into depth about that. I'm sure many of you have had a smattering of it through films like The Rabbit, Fruit, Rabbit Proof Fence. I can never say that. Um, and others. So you know that we are left by the 1970s with a degraded country in remote areas I was brought up until the 1960s, learning at school by drawing maps of Australia and having a naked savage in Northern Northern Territory drawn while wheat was drawn in other states and sheep were drawn and so on. On our school map, that was our view of Aborigines. And we were taught that they were dying out. It was called soothing the pillow of the dying race. That was the chapter in the school textbook. Well, far from it. You know, now the population is something like 20 times what it ever was then. Um, they're in every authoritative position in government, in universities, in life, and they really are dominating and taking over the position of representing Australia to the world. Art has played a very great role in that, I'm very proud to tell you, and I hope you'll see a little of what um, it meant to expose who they were through the visual medium of art. They had to find a formula. The traditional languages weren't going to work. There was 300 of them. How were they ever going to convey it through that? But it was once they were given paint and materials to express it in visual form and with people to translate and interpret along the way that the wider Australia and the world got to hear what the title of my first book was, 40,000 Years of History of Australia. There's the map of Australia with the tribes and language groups, each different colour, I know you can't read the finest print, is another dialect or linguistic group. The central part is something like two-thirds desert. So the desert is this entire area there. And this exhibition is divided into regions. The desert, the Kimberley, Arnhem Land, and the islands off the coast of Arnhem Land, the Tiwi Islands and Elko Island. I'm going to just step aside to, this is just a technical trick, to see if I can stand there and talk to you. Is this mic going to work? Yes. Hooray! <laughs> now I can see it too and know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, the zones of the exhibition that you'll see are not regional, it's in subject matter, but every painting covers all the aspects of Aboriginal thought. We have central and southern deserts, the Kimberley, the rock area of northwestern Australia, then Arnhem Land and the islands offshore of the Northern Territory and the Tiwi Islands. They're the four regions I'll be showing you and talking about. Firstly, the desert communities. 
everyone has been in a remote desert. We couldn't be in a better place than Texas to know what sort of country you're going into. <laughs> With a slight difference perhaps in that when you travel from Aboriginal community to Aboriginal community in Australia, you're driving at least 300 kilometres and the population of each little community might only be 100 or 200 people and you're often having to simply put your swag down in country that looks like that. So I've actually had the privilege of taking American museum directors into exactly that situation, putting the swag on the ground and saying, good night. <laughs> <laughs> and then getting in the car the next day and finding a very wealthy donor who's one of the party has said to the driver of that car, that Jennifer Isaac, she's got no idea. <laughs> No, no idea of comfortable hotels in the desert, if you come with me, that's for sure. What are the paintings based on? And what was desert life all about and desert knowledge all about? It's human survival in a vast and uncompromising continent where there's no water. So the fundamental essence is the search for water as for all mankind, really. Because within three days, as we know, you, if you haven't got it, you're out of it. So in a land where you can't see any water, you find it in different ways. And this is what the paintings are predominantly about. It occurs in what's here is a soak in a rock, a rocky area, and they're called soak holes or just soaks. And there you have the women beginning to dig. The soil is getting dark, but in this case, we didn't actually get to the water because they decided it was going to be at least two metres down and they had water bags in the car anyway. <laughs> and they were really doing it to show me that this sacred site, which ceremonies everywhere was sung about, um, actually was a true place. And here, Windbury Waterhole. It's, it's a huge rocky outcrop. You can see that mountains in the distance it looks like that. You might drive along and never know that that was a permanent and very important permanent water source for the Pinterby people, nomadic for eons before they were brought in to the first settlement, Papunya, in the Northern Territory um, as late as, well, the last nomads who had not seen Europeans were brought in in the 1980s, if you can believe that. They weren't actually rounded up, as, to use a euphemism, but they actually walked in of their own volition on the basis that the young boy of the group would not find an appropriate wife unless they went to a settlement. So they kept walking, looking for more family so that the marriage and the life and human existence could go on. But you can see the evidence that Aborigines read that birds come to this place, that bird droppings are around the edge. And this stone that's been moved apart, like the moving of the stone of the sepulchre, was very sort of poetic to me and to know that deep in that hollow there, right down the bottom was permanent water. The signs in the ancient rock engravings all tell Aboriginal people that. They point in directions and they mark out where the water is. Have a close look, they're concentric circles. That means water. And, and location and travel to water from the southeast. And there's the painting showing exactly that. Concentric circles, journeys across the country. This particular wonderful work by Alma Granitz was used as the banner for this exhibition. And it is a great choice. Without really quite knowing, you've picked something that shows the cosmic beliefs from the ground and also the sky. This is the story of the Seven Sisters and Orion, the constellation above which was replicated or actually occurred after an Aboriginal spirit dreaming event in which a man of the wrong kinship system was following seven women across the desert. A vast journey when it's plotted out on a map of something like a thousand kilometres from place to place. And this story is known right across the continent. And uh, ceremonies at each of these sites where they camped occur still today. It's called the Seven Sisters Dreaming. Or in the case of this painting, it was just called to the person who first bought it from the artist, Star Story, I notice. 
And this is why in the Aboriginal art trade, you can never trust the title because it's just whoever bought the painting first wrote down what the artist said. And a little bit of research gives you so much depth and, work and what was behind the work. Originally, Aboriginal desert people did not make portable art of any kind. Hence, the primitive art books that I read at university in the 60s said that in the Pacific, yes, there was great art made by the Polynesian people, but Australian Aboriginal nomads did not make art. They had boomerangs and spears and cave paintings. Well, in fact, they were making vast amounts of art, but it was ephemeral art. On the ground, great beautiful mandala-like sand patterns, and on the body, they transformed themselves into the most extraordinary down and blood-covered figures with stripes and paints and circles and headdresses and full disguising of their physical features. But in the you know, bedraggled communities of the early 70s, where nomadic people had been brought into tiny communities of besser blocks, buildings, sitting in the dirt with nothing to do and no language of, of the buffaloes, the herd of buffaloes that were us, the Western world that had taken them and brought them to this place, to explain who they were and that they had this amazing culture and thought patterns and longing for country, just incredible emotional feeling of grief. So suddenly a young art teacher discovered them making paintings on cast off bits of house. They were pulling houses apart and taking bits of old cars and painting on them with house paint. And so he invited several men to his house and they began to make small versions of the ground designs. And that took off in an incredible way, largely due to the help of the artist, and became the beginnings of the Central Desert Painting Movement. To show you what they came from, I'll just start with this image of a little bush and some men getting ready for a ceremony. With that little bush, or actually a huge bag of that little bush, they then pulverise it and, until it looks like garden mulch. Then dividing it into three, three um, piles, mix each of them into a different colour. Red for red ochre, white with white clay and black with charcoal from the fire. Then they begin on the ground to carefully construct a concentric circle of great importance related to the food of, of a type of onion that grows that is important in ceremony. Firstly, wetting. Um, they've wet, made the earth flat with pulverised ant dunes mixed with water. And once dry, they're then constructed on that. That's a little bit clearer so you can see how it's made. And in answer to many of the questions that come to me of how did they start making paintings with dots, well, my answer is it seems fairly logical when you get given paint and you've done this throughout your adult life to take a brush and make the colour go in daubs, just as you've made a mark, and also how the down and feathers were applied to the body. So having wet the surface first, they then stick on this substance and it grows in the most beautiful way. This right through the 70s was a secret activity done only by men and in fact I was the only person to have seen this happening because I was doing a major book trying to present their motivation behind the paintings at a time when they were being attacked for being corrupted. The use of non-Aboriginal materials, in other words, not using natural materials found in the ground, the bark or the so on, was thought of by art historians and particularly people who wrote reviews in the newspapers to be a corrupting influence. Um, they were sort of treated like children still, that you should keep them in their box because it was primitive art, remember, and there was a whole era in which anything that had Western materials or introduced materials was worth much less money. Those of you who are old enough to know about the history of the trade in primitive art will understand that. So this was corrupting the primitives. However, the art world began to take notice and with good exhibitions and promotion and a lot of support from the government as well, um, materials were used then that were much more sturdy and related to the world. But they were made in the same way, sitting on the ground 
and dotting and still are today. But you can see the direct relationship between the beginning of a painting and the ground painting, it's come, the thought process that it's coming from. When the paintings are made, the artist enters into a sort of trance, thinking about the country and the journey and the ancestral pathway that they're going to represent. Firstly, they mop, mop out the sacred sites, which are always the concentric circles or the water holes. Then they infill the background with the information about what was happening or where they were going. So vegetation, patterns of bush food, um, bush plums here, grass time there. And over time, if you travel out as much as I do, you see that the colours chosen are very much changing according to the seasons and according to the, the knock them down time, which is when the grass is knocked flat by the winds or, in, or a time when there's no water and, or a time when water has just been and special colours appear in the landscape. Having put the circles down, then comes the animals or humans, so tracks. Aboriginal people are major trackers, they can follow you for hundreds of miles into the desert and they know everything that's happened based on pattern until the, pa the painting builds. These images are taken from the very first group of major people who began painting in Papunya. Probably these are from about 1982, but they are the original artists who started the movement. This is a man called Charlie Eggerly, and this is a, if you can look at the track, some of you might recognise it, but not many I su suspect, but it's a kangaroo trail. And you see the V-shaped two leg, hind legs, and then the trail of the tail in between. And the two little dots at the end of the, the um, just see if I can show you. Okay, here's one kangaroo pattern, and there's the two paws, there's the tail, and there's the hind legs. Okay. Journeying from site to site across the country. This is perhaps one of the most famous artists, um, Mick Namarari, whose works have been selling in Sotheby's, particularly his, his um, more abstract later works, for anything up to about $300,000. But that's the conditions in which he did them. I'll just let you have a little look at that for a second because it is a remarkable photograph, even if I took it myself. <laughs> uh, it's because we were usually banned in that time from photographing any Aboriginal dwelling or image of the community. You, ha you could not get into these places without a government permit. So I got in because of my history in the government and I've always been a bit subversive, so <laughs> there was always the odd, odd snap for moments like this later in my life. Um, not only dreaming journeys, but also mem <coughs> memories of having walked the country are now part and parcel of depiction in, com in paintings. This is the entry of abstract expressionism that's been written about a lot in Aboriginal art. That was the dune painting, the dune picture. And this is a very simplified, tiny little painting, very minimalist and lovely that May purchased, that shows those dunes from above but it also represents the pattern in the ground made by women's feet when they line up for ceremony and hop along and drag the soil with them. When you fly over the country, as May did and Dorothy did with me, and Scott, who's here tonight too, Scott Shearer from the university, um, it's absolutely visible what's going on in the artist's mind. Now, those paintings, though, began before they had the opportunity to fly. So there was a whole period in time when um, it was sort of, I suppose you could call it the New Age era. That would have been about the 80s, wouldn't it? When people were all looking at crystals endlessly and <laughs> saying om. And, <laughs> and everyone who came to Australia who did that in America would ring me up saying, oh, you must take me out to a sacred ceremony and all that. <laughs> Well, they used to think that Aboriginal people were astral travelled, you know, and they wanted to sit and do it with them. Well, it's a little bit more pragmatic than that. When you walk the country, you feel it. You feel it with your feet. And perhaps there is an obvious thing to me, is the perception of that country is vastly different to those of us who are brought up with walls around us. So they felt the country and then saw it in their inner mind 
and painted it. And we only came later and then saw what they saw from, from the air. So you can see after rains there are vast um, lakes form and the colours change and it's very wild and wonderful. That's a, quite a recent painting of about 10 years ago from a community and an old lady that had only just started and that was her remembered journey right across her country when asked to paint her country. It's a fabulous work that May was incredibly lucky to get. We, we used, if we saw something we loved, she would put a little underbid on it and we'd sit there in tender hooks for weeks later and see if she got it. It's great. And that's at the entrance to the exhibition, a startling entrance to the show, I must say, and beautifully chosen by the curators. And another from the same era, flying across from the Kimberley to Balgo in the desert. The last old lady of the region who had been born as a nomad and had traversed just so much of the country on foot. And this is her memories, the colours she chose. Just look at it. It, it is the most vibrant lolly pink you could believe. And it's just a joy to look at. That painting was acquired on instant site by Dorothy who fell in love with it. <laughs> it, it again is rather blurred but it's, it's a, um, a version of that straight line one I showed you. It's, you can see, um, here's the journey going across the dunes, the vertical dunes, travelling up towards a dry creek that's running through them, no water there, and on, and the dots are sort of like singing and dancing along the way until you got to the soaks where you could dig for the fresh water. And as she showed this painting, you know, she sort of lent and just kept touching those soaks with great pleasure, you know, my sacred, my water, my water, like, like my child. And a different way of doing it in another community, same version, women walking across the country, site to site, vibrant, a lot of bright colours and black, very strong. That's from Ewan de Moon, north of Alice Springs, Judy Watson. And here, a unique artist who represents the same design all the time of a special gum tree that grows in the desert that sends its taproot down 30 metres till it hits permanent water. So for a long time it stays in an infant form or a non-mature form. So it's just a straight heavy wood tree with tiny little sticky things coming off the side. And, but it's very, very important to the men because that's the hardest wood they can get. And from that the clubs and the boomerangs are made. Um, and that's to show you, I just quickly looked for a few images to show you how their works are done, even though they're canvas and paint on the floor. It also shows you that it's not just as you think, mapped out perfectly and then painted in. She starts with a version of what she wants and then actually creates it with the white background at the end. So the background goes in at the end. And this, uh, a man's painting as opposed to the women's paintings I've just shown you, it, that men are much more strict about how they paint. They, they stick far more to the ground designs because men's law is so severe if you transgress. But women seem to have developed the capacity to explore their imagination with colour. And that is a woman's painting in comparison to the men where there's much freer and more um, adventurous. Uh, Ningura, the most collectible desert artist at present. This is a master work of hers. She paints mostly in black and white. And here she's painted a birth site where a woman has just given birth. So the woman's on one side and usually um, a painting like that would be about the after the birth, after birth as it is as well with streaks of this deep red ochre signifying blood. You can see the variety of patterns and 
um, access to, they have not had, had access to international art books, by the way. <laughs> it's all coming from direct from people who are making the most primal mark making of contemporary artists that I know of. Moving across then to northwestern Australia, which is the original cat, big cattle area settled by the um, early explorers. It's, it's sites of tremendous violence. Um, there was a killing period where people just disappeared and hid in caves. It's magnificent cave paintings as well of the Wanjana that was used to signify the Australian Sydney Olympics. Uh, but the Aboriginal side of it today is ochre paintings in small community centres dug up in a, such a variety of colours. Nowhere else in Australia do these colours exist and it probably is a clue to why it's a, um, a very heavy mining area, the Western Australian North area. This is Lena Nyadby and Lena's fame is that at the moment her work is the entire facade of the uh, Musée Quai Branly in Paris, which is an arm of the Louvre which the architect used as the entire facade of the museum. But she sits working away in her little Kimberley room. She wasn't impressed by Paris at all. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone vies for her wonderful paintings. And there's the Kimberleys, the Bungle Bungles, the major mountains of stripes that are extraordinary to fly over. It's uh, every metre or so is a layer of ironstone. So from the air, they're sort of like beehives with stripes. And that's called Purna Lulu. And because of the water that gathers at the bottom, it was heavily um, lived in and loved and memorialised in legend by Aboriginal people. There they are from the side. And they, I put them in because it gives you an inkling. It's almost a painting in itself to see that. And here are the Kimberley paintings about Purnalulu. Betty Carrington. Their view of uh, this work is not as the Aboriginals from the desert. Is The desert work is from above, as we've discussed. In the Kimberleys, the view is um, hor uh, vertical, so as though you're looking yourself, driving through the landscape. This is a slightly different variation because here Peter Newry has painted um, the damming of the Ord River, where government decided that in order to make the desert wet, and rainforest, they would dam the, the most, the largest river in the northwest, and in as a result, many Aboriginal people were dislocated into small towns, away from their land. But they still paint about it, and Peter tends to paint about it as a sort of large grey sickness that's flooding across his land. These odd colours are made by mixing the natural ochres, so that grey is made from mixing the black and the white. And here is a version of it by her husband, the leader of the art centre there, Patrick Mungmung. He's the son of the original man who started making the art in this area. And you can see he's got both the vertical landscapes system going as well as the um, aerial. And I mentioned on my talk, um, this triangle here, they paint the mountains as they're driving along on the roads. It's just they mem remember every hill in their country. So when the landscape painting begins, he goes by memory of the, the shape and the pattern in the hills. Although to us they might look a bit the same today, they're very differently marked. This one, so perfect a triangle, is a remembered section of a mountain that's actually absent now. It's, when you're driving, it's actually a, a, um, an upside down V and skies visible through it. And that's because a diamond mine went in there and they took the top off a sacred hill before the Aboriginal people could say boo. 
but it's still there in the mind and still reproduced always as a loving memory. On to Arnhem Land, the northern coast, a totally different environment. Wet, huge wet season that floods, the whole area is impassable right from Darwin through to the eastern coast in the wet season with these mighty rivers all made by the great rainbow serpent. So the art here dates back forever, the cave paintings of the region so well known throughout the world in Kakadu National Park, which if you come as a tourist, you go to Darwin and you take a tourist guide to National Park. Um, they've been dated at least 22,000 years, and yet the stories and legends in the ancient marks of all are known by today's Aboriginal people, and they do them in their own way on bark. So for example, an old Aboriginal painting like that that is incredibly ancient is still marked on bark here, just a little bit of technology to show you that the brush is a section of bark itself, smeared, so that you get that old rough look of the bark painting, unlike others that I'll show you where the, the works are done with very fine lines, two inches long human hair tied to a stick and loaded with ochre, laid on the bark and then lifted so that you get the finest, finest line. Here. Bark paintings not only came from cave paintings, but also from elaborate body paintings. Not like the desert, not done of ochre and down, but done with ochre uh, it alone and painted onto the body for initiations of young boys. And again, this was a, a photograph that's rare. Usually that's not permissible to photograph, but this was a demonstration by one of the artists calling his, his nephew over to show me how it was done. That's a belly button, by the way. <laughs> so that's a much finer one of an uh, image of a dilly bag, a basket. There's beautiful weaving in Arnhem Land made by the women, ancient in origin. And there's an ancestral spirit from one of the water holes, a female similar to a mermaid in the legends. But the ones you've just seen were from the Arnhem Land area closest to Darwin with the rocks and the cave paintings. Further east to the coast, to the corner of the area, that corner of Arnhem Land where there was an American um, naval base during World War II, they had a lot more to do with white people, although it only had permanent white settlement in 1935. And that was just a missionary family. Um, here there's a great deal more interchange with knowledge of the sea and sea creatures who have become ancestral characters for them. And in those you find that the marks within the bodies have great spiritual meaning. The patterns on the bark is called rark. They're long lines of, of ochre, in particular formations based on family ownership of those combinations. So I sometimes compare it to Scottish tartan because you have the clans who own certain patterns and colours. And it's, it's quite unreadable to most because it has never been fully documented or explained because it's a little bit locked up with um, men's ceremony and secrets and so on. But here, um, there's also coded into it um, secrets about the shark and about land under the sea. By that I mean what happens under the sea that's important. Here is a rock that sticks up about um, a kilometre from shore and it is the site of underground fresh water that pops up underneath that rock in bubbles that come to the surface. And not many know that sharks need fresh water within the salt. So the sharks gather at this rock. So that is a site where they take young initiates of about 15 out there and one of their tasks is to dive to the bottom of the sea and drink that fresh water. The other aspect of it that's related to ceremony and knowledge is this um, shark liver and that is a, a sacred thing. It's also something you don't eat when you ki uh, kill the shark and eat it. I don't know if you can see the lines on this work, I'll, I won't sort of elaborate, but I would urge you to 
seek that little, this is a little painting out in the exhibition. It is the finest and most beautiful bark painting I've seen for a long time. It's a painting of the wind. And it, the patterning is wonderful. Arnhem Land people also now carve in, West, in the West these figures of Mimi and spirits. This is a Mimi object. Mimis are spirits who live in the crevices of the rocks and are believed to have invented the didgeridoo and taught people all their customs, including um, marriage laws and so on. They're malevolent in some ways in that they're known to steal children if they go wandering from the camp. So they used a bit like we use the bogeyman when I grew up. Don't go out, don't get out the window at night, the bogeyman might get you. So there's that type of cautionary tales to, to families when they're living in the open and children might wander. And this very large sacred painting is showing you the depth of the knowledge of um, sea because recently they've had a sea claim in this area. They've claimed not only all the land which has now quite gone through some time ago and they won it, they've now won the sea. So they own the Australian sea beyond the high water mark and that means that that's given them a great economic clout with the tremendous fishing industry that's across the northeast of Australia and especially in the rivers and the edges for things like barramundi and um, crabs. <laughs> uh, they can set up their own little businesses if they want to or they can simply leave it pristine and protect it and that's been a major win which I was involved in. in the, it went to the High Court and it took about five years. But this is, a, this is an underpinning painting for the work of Terry Yumbelil. Some of you might have met the famous Chief Terry Yumbelil, who owns 40 islands off the coast of Australia, who came here with his Italian wife in about 2007, was it? Someone who kn knows here? <laughs> yes? Okay. And so Terry's paintings, I'll show you one in a second, are very, very different. They're much more modern and, and um, obscure and neat and sort of look almost more like manuscript and diagrams than bark paintings or Aboriginal paintings. But they come from this, this story of two sisters, the creation sisters of mankind, who interacted with many creatures in the environment and also with the whales. It's a story owned by the side of uh, the the yin and yang of Aboriginal kinship, let's say at the yang side, which is called the Yuritja. And they have great links with Indonesia over 400 years. They intermarried because the Indonesians came and camped on that coast in Australia for 400 years before white people. <laughs> uh, in fact, there's maps in Indonesia that mark out all the water holes in, in uh, Bahasa, Indonesia. Um, so there's, there's things like Indonesian kris, you know, the knives, the special silver knives that are actually used in ceremonies there in that country uh, and buried and hidden until the next ceremony. Have different meanings in the Aboriginal world, but it is a wonderful connection between cultures across the world. And, but you'll see here, um, this, this uh, pattern here of fire and danger also occurs in Terry's work. And that's one of Terry's paintings. Um, he has a, almost a non-Aboriginal syncretic religion known only to his own clan, the Warramiri, the octopus people. And that's another one of his. That's a carving of a cuttlefish. The cuttlefish are very important progenitors of mankind under the sea. They live on the edge of the... Um, the reef and breed when the coral is spawning. So they have these associations with spawning, procreation, breeding, protection of the reef and protection of the species that live beneath the reef like crayfish and octopus and so on are all connected with the cuttlefish. And that's the detail of painting that Terry generally enjoys. So this I think two or three of his works in the exhibition. And there's Terry himself. I don't know if he showed himself in his natural state, but 
out fishing. Moving lastly on to the Tiwi Islands, which has been my love and work for the last six years. The two huge islands, the largest islands after Tasmania, off the coast of Darwin. The Tiwi are not Aboriginal by race. They are themselves. They keep saying, no, we are Tiwi. When people say, are you Aboriginal? They say, no, I'm Tiwi. They say, but are you Australian Aboriginal? We're Australian Tiwi. And so they've, de <laughs> they've developed their own flag and everything. But because of the population, they don't uh, tend to stand up and yell about it and claim separate identity at every function like others do. They simply mix in. So there's the two Tiwi Islands and here's the northern coast of Australia. That's the coast. You can see how much ochre is embedded in the, in the rocks. It's pretty rugged. There were numerous ships in the early colonial times that found it on the shore here. So by the time anyone permanently went to settle, they were amazed by how much metal that the Tiwi had uh, used for all of their appliances and how many Indonesian things they had, like dugout canoes. And they are the home of these massive giant um, sculptures that usually people every major exhibition in Australia because they're easy to transport to Australia, not so easy to get here because they're literally the size of a giant tree, carved, hardwood, ironwood actually, and erected around a grave at the time of death. Now you've got an installation here, the final installation is about this ceremony of death that motivates Tiwi from start to finish. It's not as morbid as it sounds, it is the story of continuous spiritual life from birth to death and then rebirth and uh, I might just tell you a little about it as we go through these last images. There are three lovely ones from the contemporary art market that were sold into Holland and you can see the ochre is applied in quite differently, usually geometric patterns and they are the same as they were in the first photographs taken of these. The, first, the earliest I could find was 1906, a German explorer had managed to get into a remote part of the Tiwi Islands. And there is a ceremony about to take place in the 1950s. You can see the preparation of the ochre, uh, the painted bodies, the feathers being worn, the fibre bangles. Very, very hot islands. Right through the time I used to visit, no one ever wore shirts, male or female. It was just too hot. Mine was just saturated the whole time. <laughs> Sopping wet, hanging off me. But they are spectacular artworks. And I think this is clear enough for you to see in the face painting as well as on the poles that the application is with a, a special Tiwi invention. It's called the Pwodja which is a tiwi comb, so that a flat piece of timber is carved into comb spikes at the end, and then it's dipped into the ochre vertically so that you've got wet ochre suspended on all the prongs. And then uh, it's not put down flat like that, but it's applied like that to create the row. And the idea of painting fully as, as the man has a face in these paintings and is to disguise the wearer so that the body of the deceased, the spirit, will not recognise that person because the, um, there's a sort of psychological and emotional theory behind it that all across Australia, Aboriginals do not say the name of the dead for quite a significant time because they think or believe that the spirit loves that person so much that if they hear the name called, they'll draw the person, whether wife or child, to them. So it's, it's a way of explaining family grief and so that the ob objects from that person are hidden or covered. Um, it's it's a, a damping down until a major opening ceremony happens. And amongst the Tiwi, the bereaved are also look, looked after as though they're very ill. They're fed and they're not allowed to touch water or food themselves by hand. 
So for example, I have a Tiwi family and I'm always ringing up to say, how is Marie? Because I worry that some of the young people who are supposed to be feeding her are gone away and just couldn't be bothered. So I'm always like a crab, crabby granny, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to come tomorrow. So here's a, a view of um, a ceremony just before it's starting. You can see some people are moving. It's under a shade to keep out the sun. Massive posts have been made. Um, these are nagas, they're called. They're the, just a loincloth worn most of the day by most of the men. Women just wear skirts. Um, and today it's pretty, it's pretty similar, unless there's an official government body in town or a film crew and then they put on, everyone dresses in all sorts of preposterous things. <laughs> and there is the actual grave. The Tiwi were first, um, I won't say colonised by the Catholics, but there's a, an amazing story. Uh, the first person, white person to go there and actually set up any kind of permanent dwelling was an old priest from Germany who decided that Darwin had become so sin-filled that the only way he could save souls for a Christian life was to go somewhere pristine and remote where there were no bad influences and no alcohol. So he went across to the Tiwi Islands and built a little log church and set up there. But the Tiwi thought he was bizarre. He was a man without women. Poor thing. So they, they kept trying, you know, they kept bringing people around and bringing people around. No, it wasn't going to work. So then he got an idea. Okay, he'd bring two nuns and they could create a convent. So eventually some, one of the orders, I can't remember which, sent up two German nuns and they were over in another house. So this was really making the old fellas confused. <laughs> they didn't have fight. <laughs> what, what's going on? No. They weren't his wives, they were some ladies who wanted to have children. Oh, we'll give them some children. So some children turned up and that was the beginning of the education. So by the time the government task force came looking for a place to take what we now call stolen children, which was the mixed race children from the mainland, to be brought up to lead, lead good and proper Christian lives, they found a ready-made place with, with nuns to teach, a church, you know, a cleared area of land and all that. So they, the first group that were there with the church were these um, poor children who had been brought out of the mainland. But soon all the locals were be, being educated there as well. So the Christianity took over it very deeply right across the Tiwi Islands in an extraordinary syncretic way. You know, it's, it's not like, well, it's like you've seen, it's everywhere in here as well as in South America, I know. Um, but the Tiwi sing the hymns and behave in Tiwi way with nothing on in the churches today <laughs> and that's really great to hear. But when it comes to the funeral, what to do? You know, do th does the priest come and do it or do they do it their own way? So they blend the lot and now they have Tiwi who are, uh, there's one Tiwi who's become a priest as well. And I think just visible at the head of the grave you can see it cross a little bit on its side there. So the priest does his bit and then he vamooses and then they all go crazy and do their <laughs> dancing around the grave. Now the con I'm on to, finally onto the contemporary art. There's not much of slides of this to go, but just to show you how it influences the paintings on the Tiwi Islands, this cross and this vision of the earth that's coming from a slightly Christian point of view, but very Tiwi. And this is by a lovely friend of mine, Timmy, who is, can't speak very well, and some would say maybe, men, maybe mentally challenged. I don't think so, I just think it's verbally challenged with white people, <laughs> and that's common. And he, he's won now the largest and most the biggest amount of money available to an Aboriginal artist in Australia, winning the National Aboriginal Art Award of all media with a painting like this, because it's so beautiful. His explanation for this painting is, yes, I like to think of my mother in heaven. That's where she is. She's up there, you know, beyond there in the cosmos. And everybody will come and they will sing 
for me when I die, like this cross, you know, so there's the cross for the ceremony. And he said, and when I go to heaven, I will take this painting. <laughs> so I said, why would you take the painting to heaven, Timmy? And he said, so she can recognise me. <laughs> and that's one of his masterworks. And I love to look at that. In, that in, in big gallery spaces, as you can imagine, on the end wall as you're approaching it, that is like hair tingling. <laughs> and just a few inside the Art Centre shots to show you the ordinary workshop type way that people are making work literally today. And when May first came with me, this was one of the first communities we came to in the north. And it was an eye-opener and I think May had a very wonderful time on the Tiwi Islands. <laughs> There's one of the carvings that was bought for this collection on that trip and that's the image of the creation ancestor who they feel responsible for the beginning of the Pukamani ceremony, which I don't think we have time to go into too much detail on now. You see circles in every culture. This is not a waterhole or a journey across the desert, but the circle made by men when they make the big ceremony for the initiation of youth. It's just a mark in the ground. And here is when, this was the breakaway for Tiwi when they became fully abstract artists. They began to explore um, pattern in nature so each person is descended from a particular ancestor. In this case, Jean is from the crocodile. So that's an abstraction of the crocodile skin, the indentations and patterns of the crocodile back. And her work is, uh, that's a, a work that's now in the Seattle Art Museum. And there's yours truly, me, up there in the Tiwi Islands. A lot of sort of elderly white people have found a, a wonderful life just the two of them, he and his wife. That's um, John running an art centre that's called the Tiwi Sistine Chapel. And everything is painted in these art centres. Walls, outer walls, anything you can get your hands on. Just people love to paint. And on that note, that's really the truth of it all. People love to paint and we love to experience it. And I thank you all for having me. And I hope... <laughs> and I hope we can forge long-lasting ties. Thank you. Thank you.